<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey everybody and welcome back to Eggs. First things first, thank you all so much for your ongoing support and continued contribution to our ever-growing community of business leaders and entrepreneurs. Be sure to visit our website, eggscast.com, for more than 250 past interviews with the amazing people who've been willing to share their experiences with our audience. Also, be sure to follow us on the socials for the latest and greatest from The Eggs Show. But now, today's show. Today's special guest is Albert Flynn De Silver, a award-winning and internationally published writer, TEDx speaker, and workshop leader, known for his merging of the creative writing process with the practice of mindfulness meditation. Albert's work is widely known, appearing in more than 100 literary journals worldwide, and he's been recognized for his accomplishments in being named Marin County, California's very first Poet Laureate. When he's not writing, he's teaching writing, driven by a passion for showing people how they can rediscover and reconnect with their inherent creative genius, and reignite joy, fun, spontaneity, and wisdom through the practice and process of writing. Albert joins the show today for an insightful conversation about how people can use writing as a transformational process for healing, implementing practices to help alleviate anxiety and compulsive behaviors, managing fear and doubt to reconnect with our authentic, creative selves, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming you to the show, Albert Flynn De Silver. Hey, Albert, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Delighted to be here. Absolutely. We're thrilled to death to have this conversation. Thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. So, great. Hey, uh, let's uh, start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how you got into writing and, you know, um, how you got from A to B, where you're at now. <laughs> well, geez, um, I'm glad we have very, very no. broad. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it brief. But um, yeah, so I um, I was a terrible student. Uh, yeah, I grew up on the East Coast uh, outside New York City and um, kind of grew up in a in a uh, in a fairly privileged environment economically but not emotionally. <laughs> and so uh, there was a lot of alcoholism, there was abuse, addiction, et cetera. And um, so I started drinking at a young age, um, got into a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, I wasn't that great of a student. Um, I, you know, I never did well in English or writing, uh, but I did work on the, the yearbook my senior year of high school. And um, and kind of got into this photography thing, and then uh, did this uh, trip. My uh, I think it was my junior year of high school, and my dad gave me a camera, so I started taking pictures. And then when I got to college, um, they were like, well, "What do you want to major in?" And uh, I was like, "Can I major in taking pictures?" <laughs> and they, just, they were like, "Yeah, that's something you can do." I was like, "Okay, I can take pictures." So I did that, and um, I got kind of into it. And uh, I had a pretty interesting uh, teacher in college, um, this guy named Alex Sweetman, um, the University of Colorado, who's a photo historian. And um, he somehow, he was a fairly, um, he was brilliant and kind of erratic, and but somehow he liked some of my work and he liked the fact that I liked photography. And uh, so I kind of kept chipping away at it. And then, um, Graduated, flailed around for a while, painting houses and trying to cobble together an existence and decided that uh, I wanted to go back to school. And so I submitted a portfolio to the San Francisco Art Institute and somehow they accepted it. And uh, so off I went to San Francisco. And there I met uh, a, a guy named Bill Berkson, who's an art writer and poet. And uh, everyone had to go through his art history class in order to graduate. And so that was my turn on to, to writing and the intersection of visual art and writing. And um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how it all came together. That's a little bit about me. Yeah, no, I love that. Well, and I think it's really interesting to sort of the, the amalgamation of life experiences that you put together to land where you landed. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of like how the mindfulness component comes in? So you, yes. uh, you know, a, clearly a creative guy, artistic guy, you know, you're interested in writing and sort of creative things, but how does the, I guess, you know, uh, mindfulness component find its way into your, your story? Yeah. So, so there I am at the art Institute. I'm kind of flailing around, kind of lost. Um, 
And I get into this poetry thing. I get sent to this this um, poetry reading one night, and I I hear this incredible line from the poet um, Jack Spicer, where he says, um, "I think he was being quoted during the introduction to this reading." Um, and he said, the line is, uh, unbind the dreamers, poet, be like God. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, whoa, that's intense. What does that even mean? But I just thought it was an amazing line. And um, it was, uh, I didn't know really what was meant by God or, but unbind the dreamers, that that had resonance to me. And, um, and so that's kind of led me on the trajectory of poetry. I got really into poetry, I started reading a lot of it and studying and practicing my own and then hooked up with the California Poets in Schools, which was an organization, which is an organization that places working poets in classrooms throughout the state of California. Um, and and then um, I was, uh, you know, trying to deal with a lot of the emotional stuff and um, the addiction and the abuse stuff. And and one night my, my friend is like, hey, there's this, um, there's this meditation thing happening. A uh, guy is going to be talking at this place called Spirit Rock, um, it's a meditation center here in Northern California. And uh, I was like, I didn't know anything about meditation. I didn't know what that meant. Or I'm, I'm kind so of I, in the same position. I I, uh, I know nothing about meditation, <laughs> and I've I've done a little like you know YouTube video research, but nothing more than that. And I've tried meditating a few times, but. Um, I'm kind of in a similar spot as you as far as, as, as that goes. And so I'm actually, actually kind of interested to hear how your how this part of your life, you know, changed things for you, how meditation helped. Yeah, because I mean, I was so confused about it that when we were driving by and there was a sign that said Spirit Rock Meditation Center, I thought it said Mediation Center. <laughs> I was like, wait, what's meditation? Medium. Anyways, so I go to this. They had these Monday night sitting groups with this guy, Jack Cornfield, who's now like a mega star in the meditation world. And, um, you know, this was 25 years ago. And he was, I go to this sitting group and we just sit there in silence, right? And which is a novelty to me because I'm used to being in my head and always moving. Um, but I notice it feels really good to be still and to be turning inward and to be contemplating uh, loving myself, you know, and, and, uh, and, and breathing, focusing on breathing. You know, these are all like total novelties to me. And on top of it, he's reading a lot of poetry. And hmm. so then I just all of a sudden I get this intersection between creativity and uh, poetry and language and mindfulness and stillness and and waking up to like our full potential through um, through contemplation, uh, through reflection, uh, through compassion and and all of that. And so that's kind of where I started to to get into it. So I started going I, I went to that first Monday night thing and then I started going to they had these day long um, programs um with various teachers and and i just got heavy into it from there and then you know eventually i found myself on long retreats silent retreats and so forth and it just it totally helped me transcend these um the self limiting self beliefs i had you know about like whether i could be an, an artist or whether i could be an entrepreneur or whether i could make enough money to live or whether i could do anything really and it, it really just broadened my whole perspective. Yeah, no, I really like that story. It's interesting, too. I, I mean, obviously, Jack Cornfield is like the OG now. You know? <laughs> you know, back then, he was probably up and coming a little bit. But I mean, you know, he's he's like the guy now. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I guess I've never really thought about it. But I mean, you know, when you're doing creative work, you know, whether that's drawing, painting, writing, whatever it is you're doing, I mean, it almost is a little meditative just sort of by its very nature, right? I mean, you're focused in on this thing that you're doing, you're drawing from inside your thoughts or whatever, and, you know, basically laying it out in sort of a, you know, printed or written or drawn form or whatever. And so I guess it's funny because it's maybe a more obvious connection than I had seen before. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's so true. And, um, you know, you, but there's still like, I can't, I went to all these academic programs, you know, in, in creativity and, you know, the mind still can get super um, locked into various ideas and 
critique, you know, the whole like creative um, MFA program is revolves around critique seminars and critiquing work, which is great, right? Because that's all about improvement. And, and yet it's also like one has to be careful because there can be this over critiquing, right? The mind can get overly involved, can over intellectualize things um, rather than grounding in like the pure spirit of creativity and the pure spirit of connectivity and um that was actually going to be one of my questions for you was um in the writing process when should you take critique and when should you share your work with other people because i i've dabbled in a little bit of this and a little bit of that but i never want to hit publish on the blog i never want to actually kind of like you know put it out there and let see what kind of feedback comes back and um in, in your personal writing process, do you ever like, do you have like that person that you just say, hey, read this, give me some feedback before you hit the, the publish button? Or do you actually just go and make edits later? Um, it sort of depends on the piece, right? But I, I really want to re reflect on your um, your sensibility for it because it's 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 very vulnerable, right? To, to, to share work, you know, if you have yeah. this, this inner idea, this inner experience, that, that is coming from within you and to express it out, to get it out, to publish it on a, a blog, for example, or anywhere for that matter, it's um, it's a little harrowing on some level, right? And so uh, I think it is, you know, the whole editing thing is a, is a, is a, um, is a, is a big topic, but um, I think what's important is to write for yourself you know, to write your truth, to tell the truth of what's really going on for you in your story and, and how you think about things, what your perspective is on things. And then and then to balance that out with getting feedback from what I, I, I usually go first to what I call my trusted readers. Um, and those are people who I trust are gonna gonna hold me with love and support and compassion, you know, and not so much um, kind of try and jostle in for their intellectual opinion <laughs> so exactly. much right yeah. um and then i kind of try and pace myself with that and then um after getting some trusted readers and i'll kind of cast further out some professional editors because i can't see it um myself i can't see all the the editing and all the little flaws that are happening in any given piece of writing yeah um i, I think all artists kind of have to deal with whatever format, whether it's writing, whether it's a musician, whether it's Ryan, your your graphic design work. If you look in the back of his wall there, that's some of his work there. But just putting that out in front of the world and saying, hey, this is what I do. Uh, do you want to, you know, be a part of it? That's kind of in, very intimidating. And uh, it's very intimidating. And I think like with writing, it's kind of, like if I was doing a, a research piece on a specific topic, I have no problem with doing like the research. This is my findings. This is what, you know, you know, I came to a conclusion of, but when it comes to like writing, you know, personal, authentic, like the stuff that gets a little deeper, I think that that's where writing kind of takes the next step. And I, I think it kind of is another you know, instead of just, uh, you know, creating, I'm a DJ, instead of just creating a DJ mix and putting it out there to the world, writing a book for me is a lot more, you know, like that's really a little too personal. Yeah, and, right, and, and like, right. you know, how do you, how do you get over that fear? How do you get over that level of like, do I really want to put myself into this? Do I really want to start this blog? This podcast was really hard because mm -hmm. I like doing, conversations like this and getting authentic with people is is tough for me i don't know about ryan he might just take to that nat naturally but <laughs> i i didn't want to necessarily i had a hard time starting this and as it's evolved i've gotten more comfortable with it the video was a whole element i had a problem with mm -hmm. but um i mean i'm, I'm just kind of curious about like what there's I don't know. Like, how do you get over that fear? How do you get over that block of like getting too personal with people or like sharing your, your actual thoughts and, and 
being in the the public spotlight. Can I just add real quick before yeah. before you start jumping into that? Um, I just want to add sort of as this creative journey, right? Because like Mike was saying, so his background is a, you know, he's a club DJ, he performs in front of, you know, hundreds, thousands of people. He plays his music in front of everybody. You know? And for me, like that would be wildly nerve wracking, right? I mean, I don't know if, that, if that's how you feel about that, Albert, too. But so yeah. it, what I think Mike is talking about here is I think that there's sort of a, a level of comfort in your creative process, right? So he pointed out these couple of uh, illustrations I've got on my back wall here, which are a couple of things that I've uh, done sort of recently. And I've just recently opened an online store where I'm selling some artwork and things like that, right? I'm a 20 year advertising veteran and I've been running a marketing agency for you know two decades in one form or another. And, uh, and I have no problem whatsoever writing a blog, sticking it out in front of somebody, uh, creating a logo for a big you know giant corporation, you know, preparing websites or building materials for, you know, multinational organizations, whatever, no problem. Sure. But when it came down to laying myself out there as an artist, which is funny, because I mean, I've been drawing and stuff since I was a child, but um, my identity was never wrapped up in my artisticness. Mm -hmm. Rather, it was done more, my, my identity was more involved with my uh, role as a creative director in an ad agency, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of what Mike's tiptoeing around or trying to uncover is sort of, you know, a, first of all, how we see ourselves, right? And how we define our identities. And then B, exactly. how we share either the identity we have or the identity we want with other people. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me and in, in my experience, just to reflect back Mike's comments about the podcast, I, I don't like being on camera. I don't like speaking on mic. I hate my voice. I hate, you know, I have all the things that everybody has. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. but, um, but I knew that, if, if we were going to try and establish ourselves as experts in, in our space, and we were going to try and have a voice that was valuable for people who listen to the show and that sort of thing, that it was important that I just kind of bite the bullet and do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was going to suck and I know it, but, and I don't like it and it's uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? And I think sure. that there's a, a place that you have to get to, and I'm kind of experiencing that now with this, you know, art career, which is this, you know, I'm having to put myself out there. And, and as a, a person who lives in a business that all we do is critique people all day, like I'm not afraid of hearing feedback. I'm not afraid of getting a critique, right? But there's something about my identity that's wrapped up in what I do uh, for work versus what I could be as a person, right? And so I don't know, Mike, if I've totally slaughtered your thoughts, but that's kind of <laughs> no. what I, I think is it's got a little bit about sort of exposing your belly to the world. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. And I think it it all it it comes down to the mode that you're putting out there. And I I guess what I was getting at is just the writing process seems to be so much more I guess it, it really depends on the topic and what you're you're discussing and your piece of work at the time. Like you said, it, when you're working for a client, it's entirely different than when it's tied personally to your personal thoughts about a personal thing. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, like yeah. You, you got it. Part of the analogy, Mike, when you said like, so you're a DJ, you can get up there and you can create these playlists and share them with hundreds of thousands of people. But what if you were writing a song and it was your song that you're writing and you had to sit up on a stage solo with the acoustic guitar, <laughs> yeah. or maybe it was an electric guitar or whatever, and and belt it out to a crowd. Like that would be different, right? Yeah. It, so like, uh, I do this mix series called Anything Goes, and it's called it's called that because I'll play anything that's kind of like might work with another song that you wouldn't think about or this or that. And every time I put one of those out, it's kind of like. I'm judging myself really hard because it's mm -hmm. like a creative piece of, of work that my peers are listening to that, that uh, it, it's just, it's a different thing versus like, if I'm just doing a mix for a quick mix show for a radio station or something, you know, that yeah. doesn't really mean as much versus a creative piece of work that I put out to be consumed. That it, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think like authors probably deal with similar kind of thoughts all the time oh yeah well you just nailed it like self-judgment right so self-judgment and and what what ryan was saying about identity like how wrapped up are we in our identity of that so it's one thing to be you know sort of rejected by a literary magazine and then it's a totally different thing to be rejected by a um maybe a corporate client for some copy work 
<laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and it seems like too, what you were outlining with the, uh, the idea that people or like when you're rolling out new writing, for example, maybe it's a new book or an article or something, uh, that in your process, Albert, you share it first with those close readers, the people who, you know, aren't out to harm you. They mean, they mean, you, you know, authentic love and respect, you know, maybe they like it, maybe they don't, but you know, at least their feedback is coming from a good spot, right? They're not right. just out there to get you, which is all over the internet these days. Yeah. So, but, so this is maybe how you're hedging your bets a little bit, right? You can start with somebody that's a little closer to you so that you can do that. And, and, you know, I have that in my wife and my friends, Mike has that in his friends or his peer group in DJ mm -hmm. land. Sure. And, uh, you know, and then that sort of greater exposure, right? Where, like I say, we're, we're sort of showing our underbelly to people and you're actually exposing yourself in front of, of people and, you know, the, I guess the broader world, you know, is where things maybe get a little hairy. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Hey, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, how meditation works in your, uh, writing process. Like, um, you know, do you usually start a writing session with a meditation session and then kind of go from there? Is it kind of prep you to get in the flow state or, uh, that effect? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's the, um, I wrote a whole book about this and, and the, the meditations always come before the writing exercises. Um, I think it's really powerful to, to write from that place of, of not knowing, you know, that place of, of quote, spacious awareness, um, where you or that place of stillness where you can have more access to what I call the creative field. Um, that's not always how I do it, honestly. You know, sometimes when I'm in a project, you know, like when I'm working on a, uh, you know, novel project or any kind of writing project, I'm totally immersed in the story. You know, I'm I'm on the path and I'm just like, I'm waking up in the morning pretty early and I'm like, I want to reconnect with the story. And so, and my mind is kind of humming with some ideas and, and edits and changes I can make and additions and so forth. And so I'll just, I'll go right to the notebook or I'll go right to the laptop and, and start working on that. And then I'll save, I'll probably save my meditation time for later in the afternoon or the evening. Um, however, uh, if I'm in between um, writing sessions or books or projects, I will, you know, meditate first and, and you know, to get kind of get back into that that story mode or that poetry mode or whatever it is. Um, and anytime I'm ever stuck, that's directly where I go. You know, I go to stillness and I go to silence because I can't, I can't work it out in my head. Like there's no thinking myself out of my doubt, my fear, my shame, whatever it is, it's kind of getting in the way of, of accessing that creativity. I like that. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been stuck on a project or, uh, you know, you get to like a, a blocker and, and I do software kind of on the side. I'm just getting into it. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll get to a point where you're just hitting a brick wall. Nothing's working. Nothing's working. Nothing's right. working. And you just get up, take a walk. Boy. You know, it just kind of comes to you in the walk and you get back and sure enough, it, it problem solved. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I like that. I, I like that approach a lot. Yeah, I was just actually last weekend teaching a um, co-teaching a yoga and writing workshop. So it w we did a little bit of meditation, but we did some contemplative movement stuff, some yoga, which really is just all about kind of loosening up the body, right? Could be through mindful walking, uh, could be through yoga and mindful movement or Tai Chi or any of those kind of contemplative embodied activities are really powerful for just moving that creative energy and kind of getting the the small sense of critical self out of the way and getting back to that that um expansive self like that so, albert i want to go back a little bit I, i'm ruminating on our our conversation before as mm -hmm. we're sitting here thinking about you know or this this process of transformation and I know that one of the things that you happen to have experience with is using writing as a transformational tool to help overcome your, your own personal uh, issues and then, you know, sharing that information with other people. 
But as I'm sitting here thinking about your backstory, you know, sort of a, a difficult upbringing, and then there's sort of a break, right? And then you go to school and you start doing all these things. You find yourself through photography, et cetera. And then there's another break there where you discover cornfield and you discover meditation and you start to do that. And so there's two distinct breaks that I see, or maybe breaks the wrong word, but two distinct mm-hmm. transformations where your sense of self or your identity has evolved significantly from the prior state. So you went from a person who was uh, feeling shame and feeling doubt and feeling sadness and stuff from from sort of upbringing and and you know challenging parts of your youth, and then you were able to sort of I guess, for lack of a better term, transcend that and and find yourself in school and find things that were bringing you joy again, and then you found yet another level as you as you moved into meditation and and now you've been doing that for more than twenty years, and so I wonder. If you could talk about, you know, just sort of in the spirit of our, our prior conversation and in the context of your story, if you can talk about the the tools that you use to make those transitions. Oh, boy. Well, yeah, I didn't mention the psychedelic therapy cult <laughs> I was involved in. That's okay. a whole other story. But um, after actually, when I was at the Art Institute, um, I had like I had gotten sober in from alcohol in 90, 90 September 1st, 91. And um, but I'd never dealt with like those reasons of why I was trying to drown out the the pain and, and all this just grief and stuff. I'd never dealt with it. And uh, I met a friend who was at the Art Institute, one of my photo buddies, and and he was in therapy, which was a total novelty. And uh, <laughs> I was like, and he seemed to be doing well. And, and I was like, Oh, I'll join his therapy group. And he's like, yeah, they're really cool. And we do these things on weekends. And next thing I know, like, I'm just immersed in this psychedelic therapy. We did these just intense sessions on weekends using MDMA and mushrooms and LSD and all of it. And so that was a major, like, you know, mind opener completely transformed my whole sense of like, like, who am I? And, you know, what am I capable of? And what, what's, what does it mean to be human? And um, so that, that was another transition point, if that kind of answers part of your question. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I mean, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of people advocating for these sorts of, uh, you know, psychedelic experiences and things like that. These days, it's becoming much more popular. I mean, maybe we can leave the cult aspect out of it, but the rest. (laughs) That's a whole nother story. It wasn't hell. Like back in that, in those days, um, you know, and this is like a whole nother generation after the 60s, right? Like I was involved in this in the 90s, but it was still kind of hush hush and it was still illegal right? And now it's, the interesting thing is that it's all, um, you know, the science behind it has been there all along. It's just been hidden. And I don't know if you've seen this Michael Pollan Uh uh, thing on on Netflix. It's pretty amazing because you really understand like, oh yeah, the science has been there since the 1940s and 50s. And it's just gotten so distorted and through government intervention and so forth. Um, but it really needs to be held in a professional manner, you know, in a compassionate manner. And in my situation, it was not. And so it led to, that's why I use that word cult, because it was just like, it was too tied up in the ego of the people who were administering. And we weren't microdosing, we were macrodosing. You know, and it was just like this whole other, whole other scene. But yeah. I will say that it led me to dimensions of myself that I never thought possible, you know. So. It's interesting to hear people's perspective on topics like this because, you know, um, sobriety can mean something different to some one person than to another person. Whereas, you know, you had an issue with alcoholism. Um, but this other session seemed to open your eyes and, and kind of enlighten you. Um, there's people like, I know people will um, smoke pot or go running to get a runner's high or uh meditate i know people can actually kind of get into like a a high state of mind through meditation i've never actually experienced that but um it it's always interesting to analyze people's perspective on influences and how they affect their lives and for the good or worse and i'm right i'm right there with you with alcohol um i 
I've had my, my bouts with that. And, um, I've been able to kind of like get that under check. It's hard when you're in the industry and you're in a bar and you're in a club and you're dealing oh, with man. it every day. And yeah. by being able to kind of step back and only do corporate events and weddings and start focusing on more of a software thing, I've noticed I don't even need a beer. I don't need this. It's more like a social thing to have it in front of me. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts on, um, you know, using, you know, like a glass of whiskey or meditating for riding to get to that level or, you know, like, do you think that it's okay to, to kind of get yourself loosened up a little bit to get in that state of mind? Or do you think it's more like a, a crutch? You know, um, depends on the substance, right? I mean, for me, alcohol is a total trigger, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a total poison for me. Um, I, you know, I don't really have a, you know, because I've benefited from the exploration of these, these various substances. Um, I just think one has to be really careful about like, and really conscious of how it's being used. You know, are you using it to numb out in any way? Are you using it to escape? Um, are you using it to amplify some aspect of life that you feel a lack in? Um, and in terms of its relation, I don't know if you were asking this directly, like, you know, using alcohol or using drugs and your substances in any way to, to, um, for creativity. That's kind of where I was getting at is because it kind yeah. of, for me, like, if I take an edible and play music, mm -hmm. uh, I'm in a perfect place. I'm in heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, right. it's like, I kind of get in that flow state where, you know, it's me and the music, it's me and what I'm doing. Um, if someone comes and annoys me, it, it just kind of throws me out of that, that, that. So like the perfect night for me would be, you know, a glass of water and an edible and let me do my thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But totally. I, you know, like, it, and I, I, I'm only saying that publicly because I'm in Washington right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> nice. But um, what what I'm getting at is like, I, I think it's kind of important for the creativity process to maybe have some of those experiences, you know? I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's all part of the exploration. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's totally legit for the exploration. I think one just has to be careful around the, um, like, where does it take you? Where, where is there any sacrifice happening in other aspects of your life? You know, because there is that whole tradition of, you know, you look at all these famous artists and writers from days of yore who were just, you know, whether it's Jack Kerouac on Benzi Benzos or, um, you know, Hemingway on, on alcohol. Uh, there's a lot of like glorification, you know, and uh -huh. memorizing of it. And, you know, those guys both pretty much killed themselves, you know, died early. Um, so, but that's not to say they didn't create amazing art. And would they have created amazing art if they weren't drinking or if they weren't on benzos or if they weren't, you know? Yeah. It's kind of, it, it's, it's hard yeah. to say. Yeah. Uh, but I think you can do both and I think you can make great art sober. Um, you can also make great art and use substances in in moderation. So it doesn't kind of fuck up the rest of your life. Excuse yeah. my language. No, you're fine. You're fine. I hope that's a... No, no, no. no. We're, we're, we're the Apple podcast. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think it is good to sort of, you know, hedge what we're saying a little bit with just sort of, you know, obviously it's not like advocacy for any one way of life. But I think that the point overall is that, you know, we all have our own way of getting to wherever we need to get, right? And for right. some people, it might be something like that. I mean, I personally don't have a lot of experience with psychedelic type stuff, but I do know from people who are experienced with it, that for them, it's opened up a whole new ways of seeing things, or it's allowed them to see things that they didn't see prior, you know, we, whether it's self-reflective things, or it's, you know, outward things, or, or just gave them a new perspective or whatever. So I, I would have a hard time saying that it's bad. Right, right. And I think exactly. it's better to maybe not assign that value judgment to it. It just yeah. is. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it works for you, cool. If it doesn't, fine. And like anything, you know, uh, food, drink, whatever, you know, in moderation. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think that's fair. Um, can we turn the conversation just a little bit? I want to talk about sort of just the importance of being a good storyteller and being a good business mm -hmm. leader. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know that you teach a lot of people to write and, you know, you do so through meditative processes. And also I imagine some fundamental writing processes as well. And so I wonder if you could talk about just how important it is, you know, in as sort of a function of leadership, whether that's in a, in an organization or maybe even in your own family or, you know, among your peers, you know, if you want to be able to communicate well from yourself and then again, back to this idea of uncovering our inner selves, you know, how do we, how do we find that so that we can lay ourselves out on the line? Yeah, gosh, you know, um, I had, and I don't know if I included this in my bio at all, uh, but uh, I ran a, a senior home care company with my wife for uh, seven years. And, um, and we ended up with, you know, it was a multi-million dollar adventure with about a hundred employees and, so it was kind of a, it was a thing and um, which was, and it was especially a lot for a poet and a social worker <laughs> to be, like, <laughs> you know, in this business, be entrepreneurs. And um, I mean, we were direct entrepreneurs because this was a, it was a franchise business. Um, and, but we did end up buying multiple uh, locations and expanding it. And um, it was a wild ride. Uh, and, and I was being called on in terms of leadership uh, in a whole nother realm. Like, cause I feel very comfortable in that world of writing workshops or meditation, uh, classes, you know, I can show up for, you know, 10 or 20 people and, and talk about writing and talk about, um, uh, meditation and feel very comfortable and at ease and, and, you know, be a strong leader there. But when it came to, uh, being in that business world, it was like, Oh, like this is a whole other thing. This is a whole different thing. And then I had to go back and be like, well, is it different? <laughs> like, what are these elements of, of leadership? You know, it's being authentic. It's it's being true to your word. It's acting in integrity. Um, it's being a deep listener. You know, and these are all things that kind of came out of my training around meditation, mindfulness, um, being contemplative and being sensitive to other people's needs. And um and also like holding um, strong boundaries, you know, and holding people accountable. And at the same time, holding them accountable, you're also like um, providing venues and space for them to expand and to grow and to learn. Um, so I don't know if that gets at your your question there. Yeah. Well, and actually that's really interesting. The sort of connection again, between sort of the meditative process and now in this case, sort of business leadership, because I think for a lot of people, especially if you're not sort of classically trained as a business leader, maybe you're a young entrepreneur and you've started a, a you know creative business, like which was my case where I didn't go to school for business. I just had a, a skill that I had and I, I was able to parlay it into some work. Um, you know, for, for people like me, I guess my initial impulse, you know, if I felt like I needed to become a better leader might have been, you know, go back to business school or, you know, find a, a way like that to get sort of, I guess, classically trained. And so, but this idea of sort of, you know, implementing mindfulness almost from the beginning as a method to learn leadership versus the model that we talk about so often in business now, which is, well, mindfulness is now the thing. So you got to work it in, you know, like, <laughs> you know, so it's like, cause we're sort of, we're reverse engineering it now. Right. And we're starting to hear it and it's becoming common in, in the type of language they use in business, but it's uh, but that's a new thing. Right. So now we're layering that on top of this old thing. So it's interesting yeah. thinking that, you know, you could have almost come through a meditative path and come out sort of, I don't know, equally prepared in some sense for, for leadership. Yeah. Well, um, and, you know, thinking of all these, these things is totally separate. You know, I tended to think of the business world as a totally separate thing. And my, I had my writing thing that I do on the weekends and, and my meditation thing and, and never the, the twain shall meet, but I started breaking that down a little bit. And, you know, next thing I know, I was, I was speaking, I had the opportunity to speak at a, um, uh, an industry, senior care industry, a networking event um and uh they're like well what do you want to talk about and i was like well let's talk about can i talk about creativity and can i do a writing exercise <laughs> so i had this so i had this room full of like 100 senior care providers and i got them all like writing and it was like one of the sweetest most fun meetings we'd ever had because usually you know it was like somebody from the senior care world they would talk about a certain aspect of like the care that's needed in the community and, you know, a certain aspect of like um, senior health or, you know, 
family relationships or whatever. And then here we were all writing poems together. <laughs> it was kind of fun. <laughs> it's pretty great. Well, and it's funny too, just thinking that, you know, your background was in care of other people too. And that sort of ties in with all this also. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty wild how all these paths are sort of intersecting. Cause they, I think, you know, just like you described, I mean, prior to this conversation, I was trying to piece together, you know, how do all these things come together? You know, it feel <laughs> totally disparate to me. And so, uh, but now as we're working through them, it's like, well, no, duh. I mean, they're all the same thing, you know? And I, I don't know if that is a, like a, a broader perspective on just life in general, that it's kind of the same. So stop overthinking it. Like, every- <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> like, Hey, I, I'm not sure if that's how to go with it or not, but, um, but I think that it, it's just interesting, you know, hearing how that your story comes together and everything sort of falls into place but it all sort of re- revolves around the same, you know, eight or 10 skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, kudos to you guys for, um, you get the prize for asking the most diverse and comprehensive series of questions <laughs> of any <laughs> podcast that I've ever been on. Well, well, great. We'll you. be putting that on a plaque just so you know. Yeah. That's gonna be that was, that awesome. was pretty cool. I was like, seriously, <laughs> after a while, after the second page, I was like, what, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought like, oh, well, this could actually, this would be an interesting thing to, to riff off of in yeah. a conversation. Well, let's, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to, I was going to ask you what your normal, um, like, what does a writing workshop process go through? Like, what do you do at a, at a workshop? Well, typically, they're all kind of a little bit different. But typically, what I love to do is is do some warm-up free writing exercises so that we can outpace that critical mind and that self-conscious fear mind or the, you know, comparison mind. And, you know, we do that by these short-timed writing exercises. And I'll just, like, throw out a prompt and, and then we'll write like super fast for, um, you know, like five minutes or seven minutes. And, and I ask people just to like, don't worry about like, you don't have to share this. We're not going to like judge this. You don't have to like worry about punctuation or spelling or anything. We're just like, go. Like when you hear the prompt, just whatever's in your head, just write down the piece of paper, go margin to margin, it just blaze. And, um, and that tends to allow people to, um, to really get at the heart of what's, immediately in their soul, you know, in this moment. And it can oftentimes be much more revealing than if we're contemplating and being like, oh, that's inappropriate. Or, well, maybe I shouldn't write that. Or I don't want to share that in front of these people. And, you know, so like all the voices start coming in and they like cut off your access to your, your the spirit of what you really need to, to share. Um, so that's like a, an entry point that I love to do. And then we have uh, then we go a little bit deeper with the prompt and i always like to engage with process a little bit around that so you know maybe there's um we accumulate some language and it might be that i i throw out some some different word clusters or um you know categories that people can jot down and start accumulating some words and language to bring in some detail um we might talk about metaphor and simile or personification or some poetic elements and what those mean and how we can integrate those into our writing. Um, and then we have a, you know, just more involved prompts in which people can write um, for longer periods. And then they can also integrate their discerning mind, you know, and, and integrate their knowledge base and bring all of that to bear. And then be able to see like, oh, this is my mind on free writing. <laughs> and this is my mind on my brilliant ideas. And they're both really super important, right? And how do we integrate the two to make our writing even better? Yeah, no, it's funny. And again, just you know, to draw another parallel to business, so the process you're describing is so similar to like an agile design process. Like uh, they do something very similar, you know, when you're designing software or if you're using it for ideation, this kind of thing where it is, you know, you, okay, you've got five minutes, put as many ideas as you can on the wall. And then we're going to select from those ideas and then move forward to this batch, you know? And so it's really interesting again, and just how these, uh, all these parallels exist. I, I, uh, I don't know why, but I'm, I'm fascinated now by all that. <laughs> so, no, this is great. And your audience is primarily, um, entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. and so, and that's the thing is like, I don't know if we totally made the case for meditation just yet. Um, <laughs> so I would like to start moving into it, but, um, but I think one of the, you know, maybe the biggest insight that I've had so far and, and Mike, you can tell me if you agree is, is this idea that, you know, it's all kind of the same thing, you know, like I, I feel like in my mind going into this conversation, I was like, okay, well, you know, the, vo- the, the conversation I need to have for the business people and the entrepreneurs who listen to us mm-hmm. is this business centric thing. Right. And this was me trying to put rails on a conversation, right. Even if it was inadvertent, right? this is me, how do I steer it in a certain way? And so it's been really interesting or sort of enlightening that as we sort of push the, the rails out or said, you know what, these rails are stupid and started talking about just sort of the creative process in general, how much of it just kind of slams it all back together. You know, it's, it's a really interesting process. So I'm quite enjoying this. So well, me too. Me too. Yeah. So what I wanted to get into next, and, and maybe this is a little bit more brass tacks or a little bit more applicable uh, topic is how do we actually integrate a mindfulness process? Mm. And so I think that there's a, a number of factors here, you know, whether it comes down to just prioritization and making space for a meditation process, that sort of thing. And then I think there's also maybe dissuading some things, you know, like maybe, uh, sort of, I, I mean, at least statistically speaking, we're moving further away from what you would consider spiritual or religious in this country. And I think there's some stigma tied to sort of religious thinking and, and meditation and things like that. And, and so I, I, I'm afraid so many people discount before they even give it a shot. Right. And I will say, uh, so I just finished after 12 years, I just finished a bachelor's degree. And um, in my yeah. last, <laughs> Congrats. Congratulations. In my last yeah. semester of that uh, program, I needed a one credit class and they had a, a meditation and mindfulness class in there. Mm-hmm. And so I took this one hour class and it was just one hour a day. So, I mean, it wasn't like heavy meditation or anything, but in that process, I became more familiar with meditation than maybe I'd ever been. And since then, now I use an app called Headspace and, mm-hmm. you know, I try and do it with some regularity. I'm not very good, but you know, I'll, I'll get there one day. And so, <laughs> but I wonder if you can just talk about sort of, you know, maybe a little bit of the, the how and the why or the benefits of integrating a mindfulness process and how one could go about it. Because I think, you know, again, people think that it's big and complex and it's this hard thing to maybe install when really it could be as little as a couple minutes a day or something like, so, right. so maybe you can just sort of expand on that idea. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Ryan. And, um, you know, it's funny to hear you say that I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Cause it's like, <laughs> when you really break it down, it's like, okay, what are you not really good at? Right. In in that context <laughs> of meditation, cause it's the simplest thing in the world, right? Meditation is basically sitting there and doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is, is, uh, I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but essentially it's not much more than that. So it has this really simple aspect to it. And yet it's one of the most difficult things for us to do as human beings, right? Is to settle our mind, to calm our mind, especially in this day and age, right? Like the just the media bombardment is constant. And if you're like, you know, me and most people, like we're engaged with our phones all the time. We're engaged. And then when we put our phones down, then we jump on Netflix, right? And then when Netflix is over, we jump back on a laptop to check one more email. <laughs> so there's this like constant interruption of, um, you know, what I might call like, I don't know, just sort of pure, um, unadulterated consciousness, which is which is really just being in the world you know, with your senses wide open. Um, And so to integrate that is to really, to to start slowly, you know, to start small with, you know, five minutes. Can I sit still for five minutes and do nothing and simply be with my breathing and be with my awareness, whatever that means to me. So the the process of sitting still for five minutes and being aware of my myself i'm really good at yeah it's it's the focusing on the breathing and i've heard that you just you 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 want to just focus intently on that let all your other thoughts kind of go away and it's the not thinking of other stuff that i have a hard time doing yeah you know, I, so that's why I hate hearing that because that's not what meditation really okay. is. Okay. See, that's what I've been told. And that's, uh, exactly. It's like, you have to like lose all your thoughts and not think of other no. stuff. It, for me, no. I'm like the point of like meditating and getting in that mindset is to gather my thoughts, to get perspective on what I need to do for the day, to like just try and put it like slow it down and get all the pieces together where they need to be that to me would be my kind of what I need out of meditation. But like the thought of just like 
focusing on your breath and the, and nothing else that that's where I have a really hard time. So I'm glad to hear you kind of back that up a little bit. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not so much that, that you're focusing intently. It's, it's that you're just being, and you're just noticing and observing. So if we can come to meditation with curiosity and not any kind of agenda, like, oh, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to be concentrating on my breathing. I'm supposed to be do that. You know, that's just more noise. And if we can come to it rather just as like, oh, I'm just being here. Okay, what does it mean to just be still? And if the mind is super busy and there's lots of thoughts, oh, noticing lots of thoughts, busyness of mind. Okay. But I'm still, what I'm doing is I'm just being in the space. I'm not having to act on any of those thoughts, right? It's just like noticing, oh, I'm really hungry. And normally, if you're like going through your day and you have the thought, oh, I'm really hungry, you're going to run to the fridge, right? You're just going to go grab something. But you've made this dedication to just be there and be still. And so then you can notice, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, there's hunger. That's interesting. I've never really experienced hunger without it being eclipsed by stuffing something in my face. <laughs> like, what is it? What does it mean just to notice hunger? And that's just one physical sensation, right? Um, yeah. Well, and I was just going to add that one of the things that I took from this class, right? Because I think my experience was a lot like what Mike's describing, right? I think if you're the the average person and you are thinking, okay, you know what? everybody's talking about meditation. This is something I want to try and do. You sit down and you do do that. Right. I mean, like I did, I was doing the same thing that Mike was where I'm planning my day. I'm doing whatever. Right. Like, but it was like active time. Right. And in fact, when I tried to settle my mind, it actually became very combative because I felt like I was in there just batting away ideas like stop yeah. it. I'm trying to be quiet. Shut up. You know, like, what are you doing? Exactly. And uh, in this class that I took, and and maybe it was in the text, and it may have been Cornfield's book, actually, um, that was the, the text for that book or for that course. But one of the things that I took away from it was rather than fighting with the thoughts, right? And, and this is probably very basic, so I, I'll probably sound stupid to you. But, no, 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 <laughs> but no. the idea is that, you know, basically, instead of combating these thoughts, which is what I was doing, you know, sitting and batting down all these ideas, the idea is just kind of let them pass, like come and go. It's like watching a river, right? Like yeah. just the water moves and these dumb ideas or whatever will come into your head and out of your head, mm -hmm. but don't stop and ruminate on them. Just kind of let them be. And, uh, and for some reason, I, don't, I wish I could remember exactly how I heard it the first time, but it changed the whole thing for me yeah. and that now I can sit and do that and not focus on those ideas and not mm -hmm. try and use that time as planning or preparation time or, or whatever. Right. And, um, and I think that that's, Part of it, at least, you know, and you cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that a big part of that is using this meditative time to really just kind of, I, I guess, get comfortable with sort of a, a level of silence that maybe we're not used to. The, you know, the rest of the time we're just trying to, uh, you know, battle upstream for the next dollar or the next win or the next client, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever it is. And this is actually just time that we're just meant to leave alone. And and so, but it feels so weird and foreign because we just we don't leave time alone any, anymore. It, absolutely. No, beautifully said. And if you think about it, like, you know, the, the context of a business environment, you're already thinking like, how can I use this as a tool to get what I want, like to get more clients or to get more money or to get more influence or to get whatever it is. And that's not what meditation is about. <laughs> meditation is not about accumulation. Um, it's not about agenda. It's not, um, there's no purpose to it which is also for, it's hard to wrap your head around that. Like then, then why am I doing this? Which isn't to say that there aren't benefits that arise from it. But if you come at it like, okay, I'm trying to sit my thoughts, I'm trying to like be calm and I'm trying to focus on my breathing. Then you, that, then you get like, you know, it can build the agitation. Um, having said that, you know, bringing awareness to the breathing can sometimes ground us but it can also sometimes distract us. Um, so there is a there is a freedom to, you know, one of my teachers, this guy out here in California named Adi Ashanti, he, um, he talks a lot about um, less technique, the better <laughs> when, when approaching meditation, because we can get caught up in technique. It's just another thing that our minds get caught up in. And so if we just come to it with a sense of curiosity, the sense of wonder, 
Um, and we're not trying to do anything. We're not trying to accomplish anything. We're not trying to get it right. Like there's no right way of doing meditation. Um, and yet, you know, you do want to see some sort of res results, but results isn't part of the, the meditative program. So it's just like total, um, uh, I forget what do you call those um, contradictory patterns that repeat infinitely. There's some term for it. But anyways, it's, it's kind of like that, a paradoxical um, infinite loop that you can get sort of caught in. Um, yeah. No, so I, I don't know if that explains anything. Well, <laughs> well, it, well, it's funny, right? Because the explanation is it's for nothing, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the reality is that the benefits are, are great, right? So you do see things. And I guess, I mean, if I'm trying to make a business metaphor or something, you know, it's like doing the the small task every day, you know, it's the doing exactly. the whatever it is, right? Maybe this is the, or maybe it's, you know, personal finance and we're saving. We're eating the frog, and, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Yeah, and so I think it's kind of that idea, right? And so it's, it's I don't know, it's almost asking that we have a faith that this will work for us, you know? And I mean, you can almost, it would, you'd be hard pressed to make an argument that just taking a, a few minutes for yourself to be quiet is, is, is a bad thing. Like that would be a, a tough case to make. So, yeah. so anyway, um, you, uh, you have a quote in your book. Um, and I, I heard it referenced in another podcast that you, you were on. Uh, it's called the quote is uh, time is something that you have or don't have time. is Oh, time is not something that you have or don't have. Time is something that you create. Yes. And uh, that stood out to me while I was listening to that podcast. And I think it it applies to not only the meditation, but it also applies to like setting aside time to write, setting aside time to create, setting aside time to, you know, if you have something you want to do or achieve in your life, you have to be able to set that time aside and make time for it. Not, you know, the fact that it, you know, if you never actually make that step and set that time aside, you'll never actually get, get the work done. And exactly. I think it, it, it applies to meditation as well. Like if you, if you need or want to do it and experience it right, you need to actually set the side, time aside to do it. So. That's exactly it. You know, and, and think about all these ways that we limit ourselves through self-defining. Like I remember when we were first starting our, our home care business and, um, my wife was like, well, you know, we're going to have to get up in the early and do exercise in the morning. And I was like, uh-uh, like, <laughs> I'm, not not, not, <laughs> I'm not a morning exerciser. I do all my like bike riding and exercise in the evening or the afternoons. And she was like, well, that doesn't work. You know, we've got an hour and 15 minute commute and we got a rally at, you know, 630. And I was like, it was the hardest thing, but, you know, I just started doing it and we did it together. We supported each other and we'd go up our hill every morning and with the dog and just make it happen. And within, you know, 30 days or maybe it was longer, 45 days, something like that. I just started to get into the habit and it just became part of the routine. And, and it totally changed my whole scene in terms of what, so, like, um, and another thing that you talked about in that same episode is rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that actually, because I, I, I was, I was going to ask, you know, like, well, you're not a morning morning person. You tend to, you know, you, you want to do your exercise in the evening. That's a cycle that you kind of put yourself into mm -hmm. um, noticing those rhythms in your life and being able to augment them and change them, you know, just by doing the exercise in the morning that changed up the rest of your day um do you think some people are just not morning people and they shouldn't get up and do stuff in the morning <laughs> or do you think that like because I've, I've heard both i've heard like you know if you're creative at night and that that's your time work at night why why realign your your life to accommodate someone else's schedule if you're getting the most done at night you know so as a as a creative or someone working in the industry, if I do better from 10 to 1 a.m., why don't I just make that my schedule? Totally. So, yeah, I don't rock know. on. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I was like, I was feeling kind of, I was trying to get, never mind, whatever. <laughs> no, no, no. I totally see what you're saying. I think it's the, the thing is you should just really leverage what does work for you and just watch those self-imposed limitations, right? So okay. I was clearly, I had a self-imposed limitation. 
Like I'm not a guy who exercises in the morning. Like I don't, I just don't do that. Um, and part of that too was because I, I'd like to save <laughs> my creative mind for the writing and I didn't want to interrupt with like having to go exercise. Yeah. You know? um, oh, I, I, we could probably talk like this for another hour and a half, but we're kind of getting to that point. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell people where they can reach out and how they can get in contact with you? Um, maybe uh, buy your book. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, Albert Flynn D And I'm on all the social media channels, usually with my name. And uh, uh, the book is available worldwide. Um, it's published through Sounds True. And, you know, it's available at Amazon. And actually, if you want a discounted copy, you can go to the website. That's the best place to get a discounted copy. Perfect. Um, but I really appreciate that. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for yeah, making great. time for us. I yeah, really thanks. enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for, for doing this. Yeah, it's been, uh, it was eye-opening in a number of different ways. I really appreciate it. No, oh, really fun. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. See you guys next time.